Good evening. So good to see you back tonight. So thankful for the opportunity to be a part of this conference. I was blessed this morning. You are back here because you love the Lord, because you love each other, and maybe you're interested in the Great Awakening. That's uh, that's what we're about this week. But we're not not primarily focused, I'm sure Dr. Martin would agree, uh, we're not primarily focused on informing you about a bunch of historical events. I mean, I think history is interesting, and some of you agree. By the way, if you're one of those people who says, boy, I don't like history, then you got a problem with like a fourth of your Bible. <laughs> God, God chose to reveal an awful lot of truth through history, and he apparently thinks it's, uh, it's revelatory, it, it teaches. But, uh, but we're primarily interested in personal impact of these truths. And so as tonight, we talk about the impact of the Great Awakening, I hope that you will walk out in courage because, in fact, I'm going to try to trace this topic in such a way that you feel that the impact has rippled all the way to you. Uh, I believe it has. Uh, My wife uh, nudged me right before I walked up here and said, say something about Maranatha. I'm like the worst salesperson in the history of the world. But pray for us. School's starting up here in uh, too soon. And... uh, Anytime I talk about Maranatha in churches, I say, you know, we're an educational institution, but we're primarily about discipleship. We want to see men and women getting to know God better on our campus. You know, we have accredited degrees and online and all that stuff. But if people don't get to know God better, we fail. So pray for Maranatha Baptist University, where uh, I've served now for 22 years in Watertown, Wisconsin. And if you're ever passing through Wisconsin, stop in and say hello. The impact of the Great Awakening. What? hath God wrought. Uh, Anybody know where that's found in the Bible, where I got that little statement? What hath God wrought? I'll read it to you. It's Balaam's prophecy. Numbers 23, 23. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. Neither is there any divination against Israel. I mean, you can do what you want to try to bring them down, but it's not going to work. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what hath God wrought? That is, people are going to look later on and they're going to say, wow, God must have done this. Because nothing could stop it. That is, you could try whatever you wanted to get in the way of this, but if omnipotence behind it, God achieves what God wants to achieve. And so we want to try for just a few minutes tonight to talk about the impact of the Great Awakening and its continuing impact. I want to give a caveat to begin that only God really knows what the impact is of any revival, whether it's a revival of a nation, a region, a a church, whatever. Uh, The reason for that is the visible results are not always real and real results are not always visible. And so it's really hard for us to kind of figure out Uh, what's actually taken place. But I believe there's apparent impact, and that apparent impact is going to be my outline. And I didn't just pick three because I'm a Baptist. I actually think there are three major areas where this impact is apparent. First of all, personally, God saved a whole bunch of people and launched a whole bunch of missions as a result of this revival. Secondly, there is ecclesiastical impact. And at this point, If we had just weeks, we could talk about the impact among Presbyterians, among Congregationalists, among Anglicans. It impacted everybody. But surprisingly, and I'll talk about why it's surprising in a few minutes, the greatest impact of the Great Awakening was among Baptists. And that would be unpredictable in 1740 when literally none of the Awakening preachers were Baptists. And then third, there were national effects, which I think were extremely important. All right, so let us go in that order. First of all, personal impact. This is repeated from this morning. Some of you will remember that the New England population was about 340,000. I should have made that a pop quiz. But it was around 340,000. And conversions have been estimated at around 7 to 14% of the population. Now, since they were already church members, this has to be estimated rather wildly. It's really, really difficult to measure. Most of the converts were already in church. Later on in American history, there's going to be a tremendous revival known as the prayer meeting revival uh, in the 1850s, in which roughly one in 30 people from the Pacific to the Atlantic are going to be added as members to evangelical churches. So that's a pretty great revival. And that can be counted because 
America was a lot less religious by then, and people needed to get saved and join the church. Well, these people are mostly already believers. It's also hard to measure because many of the converts stopped going to their church. That is, they had been in a parish church, and then they get saved and decide they want to go to a dissenting church now because the dissenting churches are more on fire for God than the parish churches are. So church attendance drops among the established churches. So it's all really hard. And that's why these numbers aren't that significant other than to say this was an amazing revival. God just saved bunches and bunches of people. And you'll notice that I'm primarily talking about New England. The revival also hit the middle colonies, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, that area, as well as the southern colonies from Virginia down to Georgia. No doubt lower percentages, but the impact was really significant. And I call this the Whitfield effect. If you're here Tuesday night, we're going to talk about George Whitfield, arguably the greatest evangelist in American history, world history. And the reason I mentioned the Whitfield effect is most people think of the revival, the Great Awakening, as primarily hitting New England, Pennsylvania, a little bit of New York. That's it. But Whitfield traveled up and down the colonies preaching. Up in those colonies, the authorities were largely like, man, let's invite Whitfield. Down south, the Anglican church there had no use for him whatsoever. But that wouldn't stop Whitfield. He just kept going and preaching. And many years ago, uh, mid-90s, my wife and I were vacationing in the middle of South Carolina. Uh, I think our, we were at a cabin near Sumter, and then we went down to Charleston and Florence. We visited several places. But we were driving down a state highway, and we saw a historical marker or something that drew our attention to a little old church back in the woods. So we stopped and I had to see the old church and it was open. And we walk into the vestibule of this old church in the middle of nowhere. And there's this massive picture. And I said, that's Whitfield. And then we read the little caption. It said, George Whitfield traveled through here on a preaching tour, stopped and preached one night and went on the next day. And so many people got saved. They started this church, you know, 1752 or something. I mean, it was shortly after the great awakening. I thought, you know, uh, this revival went all over the place, it went everywhere God wanted it to go. So the first impact is just lots and lots of people getting saved, including maybe your great, 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 great grandmother. I don't know. But then secondly, it launched missions. And in particular, it launched missions to Native Americans. I'm calling them Indians because they referred to them as Indian mission, but primarily Native Americans. There had been some efforts and it would repay you to study the life of Roger Williams who was the earliest colonist to say, so what are you guys doing to win these Indians to Christ? And everybody's like, have you met these people? You know, I mean, they're savages. And William said, they're humans. They have souls. We, we got to win these people to Christ. And he worked very hard to do so. And then John Eliot was one of the few Puritans who really caught a vision for this and established, he won scores of Indians to Christ, started praying towns all over the middle of Massachusetts. Magnificent story. And then King Philip's War broke out, and all those towns were burned down, and, and the work came to nothing. But very little had been done. Overall, New Englanders, as well as the other colonies, either neglected the Indians or were downright hostile to them and had very little concern for their souls. But revival changes that. Three people I want to focus on, although it's broader than these three names, Eliezer Wheelock, Samson Ockham, and David Brainerd. Let me briefly tell you their stories so that you can see how revival becomes an impetus to evangelism. Eliezer Wheelock was the pastor of Second Congregational Church of Lebanon, Connecticut, for about 34 years. He was a Puritan minister, part of the established church. But in the 1740s, he got excited about this awakening that was happening, and he got permission from his church to travel around being one of the awakening preachers. He didn't leave his church, he just traveled as pastor, just like Edwards did oftentimes, where he would go to neighboring churches. He became the chief supporter of the awakening in Connecticut. Well, there were a lot of these great pastors who were doing this, but he developed a deep burden for Native Americans. And he met a young Mohegan by the name of Sanson Ockham. Ockham uh, worked with Wheelock for about four years as an understudy, and, and Wheelock poured his life into Akka. He started mentoring other Indian men. And then by 1754, he had a thought that, you know, there are a lot of these Indian young people that if we could get them into an educational setting, we could win them to Christ. Let's use education. The history of missions, 
is the history of breaking into new fields via education, medicine, and, you know, other ancillary things. But education and medicine being the two big ones. So he started a charity school for training Indian boys and girls in 1754. He got it paid for by the churches, so none of these kids had to pay any kind of a tuition. They gave him a general education, taught him English, taught him skills. The intent was to train them up as missionaries to their tribes. How successful were they? Not a lot. That is, we, we can't speak of hundreds of missionary kids going back and winning thousands of Indians. I, mean, I wish that had happened, but this is a tough nut to crack. That is, if you study the history of missions in North America, missions to Native Americans is one of the saddest stories you'll ever study. Why? Because the trappers with their guns and the army with their guns almost always get there before the pastors with their Bibles, by which time the Native Americans are not real interested in the white man's God. So we had very limited success overall in evangelizing Native Americans. But my point here is that somebody like Wheelock says, listen, this is a mission field and it's right here at our doorstep. Well, after limited success, in 1769, he resigned his church, moved to Hanover, New Hampshire, and received donations from a gentleman by the name of Dartmouth, Lord Dartmouth. And they started Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, Wheelock, uh, left the pastorate to become the first president. And at this point, they decided they needed an income stream. And so they started targeting the children of colonists rather than just Indians. For a while, it was multiracial with Indian and colonial kids. Unfortunately, that didn't really work out very well. And, uh, and the missionary purpose of the school was lost. The second name then is Sanson Ockham. He was a Mohegan. He was descended from Chief Uncas who has come down to us in literature as a famous character. He heard awakening preaching in Norwich, Connecticut in 1740 and got saved. So he is a direct result of the Great Awakening. He met Wheelock and studied under him there in Connecticut for four years. You see a picture of Occam. He has clearly been westernized. Well, westernizing converts was the norm of missions in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, the idea of contextualizing and becoming them to win them took a long time to work. So people like Hudson Taylor and Lottie Moon, they had to break down some of those barriers. They weren't doing that in the 18th century. So they would win somebody like Occam, pretty soon he's dressed like a colonial Puritan minister. But praise God for how this man transformed. He moved to Long Island, New York, and became a teacher and preacher among the Montaukett Indians. So he's, he starts a church there. And he starts a church in which he's teaching congregational Puritan theology. He's baptizing, uh, well, I say baptizing, he's sprinkling babies and saying, I baptize you, and he's performing marriages, and he's, he's got a tremendous ministry going. Finally, after 12 years of doing that, the other minister said, you know, I think this guy could be ordained. Now, he probably could have been ordained a lot sooner, but he's Native American. And a, a, a group of Presbyterian ministers there in Long Island, uh, met together and ordained him to Presbyterian ministry in 1759, which may seem no big deal to you. It was a big deal in 1759 to ordain a Native American to gospel ministry. He was then sent as a missionary in 1761 to the six Iroquois nations in upstate New York. That's dangerous, whether you're Native American or not. And he ministered there for several years. And then in 1765, Wheelock said, we really need money for the school. Could you travel to England for us? And he agrees to do it. And they send him across the Atlantic Ocean to Britain, where he travels across the country preaching three to 400 times, raising about 12,000 pounds for the school in Dartmouth. And really, that money, along with the generous donation of Lord Dartmouth, got the school off the ground. And I wish I could tell you that it remained true for the next 300 years. Uh, but if you know about Ivy League schools, that's not the case. And in fact, when Occam got back and discovered that the school was no longer focused on training Indian missionaries, he was very disappointed. He ministered to the Mohegan Indians in upstate New York for the rest of his life, for a number of years. And one interesting fact to close Occam with is he was involved in the founding of a little community of converted Indians in Waterville, New York, called Brothertown. This is one of the few Indian villages, Native American villages, that continued as a village of Christian Indians 
for several centuries. And in the 19th century, when Native Americans were being shipped across the country to reservations, they got shipped to Wisconsin and were settled in Calumet County. And now there is a town, Brother Town, which is on the east coast of Lake Winnebago, about an hour and a half from where I live. And when I learned this last week, I thought, man, I need to drive there and see this. <laughs> I've never been to Brother Town, but I'm, I'm going to get there. Uh, I, I know where it is. So that's Samson Occam. And then third, you've probably heard David about David Brainerd. I'd love to tell you a great deal about him. He was converted on 17, in 1739 on the eve of the awakening. Influenced by awakening people, he went to Yale, or what would be Yale, to study for the ministry. At the time, the Yale faculty did not like Whitfield and his, quote, enthusiasm. That is, Whitfield was preaching dynamic sermons that you must be born again, and the Yale faculty were unimpressed. And they just, and they were kind of, uh, downgrading the revival to their students. But then they made a, a strategic error in inviting Jonathan Edwards to give the commencement address in 1740, and he utterly shocked them by thoroughly endorsing the awakening. A number of students were deeply impacted, both by the revival and by Edwards' talk, and Brainerd became the leader among them. But he was a young man, and he was overheard criticizing the faculty. One of the famous statements was, that tutor, he has no more grace than a chair. Well, the tutors were the faculty, and it's not good to be overheard calling a faculty a graceless chair. And then, when the rector made an announcement that you should not be supporting these revivals, he told a fellow student in the hearing of somebody who ratted on him that that rector should drop down dead for it. I'm surprised he doesn't drop down dead for attacking the revivals. Well, he got expelled. He was a very promising student, very bright. The New England pulpits then were all close to him. You get expelled from Yale, nobody's going to take you as their parish pastor. Furthermore, through numerous appeals, including one from Edwards, who had met him and thought he was very impressive, people were writing letters like crazy to Yale saying, listen, don't kick a guy out for a few unguided um, you know, unguarded comments. He could never get a pulp. Well, what are you going to do? John Piper, in a biographical sketch of Brainerd, says he was a contemplative and a scholar from head to toe. If he hadn't been expelled from Yale, he may well have pursued a teaching or pastoral ministry instead of becoming a missionary to the Indians. That is, God can take a young man making a stupid comment, getting caught, getting turned in, of administration overreacting and refusing to be reasonable to land somebody among Indians who need Christ. Isn't that great? So he moved among the Indians in 1742. This is right in the heart of the Great Awakening. He ministered successively in Conomic, Massachusetts, the forks of the Delaware and Pennsylvania, across Wheatson, New Jersey. He was a missionary of a Scottish society for the propagation of the gospel, so they assigned him to his different posts. He went through numerous trials. Uh, Indian ministry was tough. Uh, they were displaced people even then. They were losing their culture. They could see their culture going away. And they embraced alcohol as it was presented to them. And many of them were very resentful. He had terrible health, tuberculosis, depression. His diary, which you ought to read, documents deep, deep struggles. But God used him. And in cross weeks, and especially, they had over 130 conversions in his first year there in a place that most outsiders said, there's no way you'll ever see any of those Indians coming to Christ. Well, I must be brief because I have a lot of story to tell you tonight. But he, uh, the tuberculosis began to get him. And Jonathan Edwards invited him to come live in his home. And he did for the last several months that he was alive. And he was cared for by Edwards' 17-year-old daughter, Jerusha. And at this point, the historians are sharply divided. Uh, the early historians, and it's been repeated by a number, including some recent ones like John Piper, say Jerusha and Brainerd fell in love and got engaged, and then he died, and it broke her heart, and she caught the tuberculosis and died shortly thereafter. And it's one of the saddest and most romantic stories you could ever tell. And then biographers like George Marsden say, yeah, right. You know, things only happen like that in fairy tales. Uh, I don't know, but if I was telling the story, I, I like the they fell in love and were engaged thing. Brainerd died October 9th, 1747 at age 29. What's interesting is that his brother John, 
said, I will go and pick up the mantle that David left. And John Brainerd went among the Cross Week Sun Indians and worked among them for the next 40 years and saw hundreds of converts. Jerusha died just a few months later, and they're buried side by side in the family plot. Why is Brainerd success, uh, important? Because Jonathan Edwards wrote his life story, The Life and Diary of David Brainerd. It's not a super easy read because there's page after page after page of Brainerd's reflections on his spiritual condition. Very introspective book. But it's a book about giving yourself completely to God, loving God. It's a book that embodies the religious affections. And it was incredibly influential. Here's just a partial list. These are all missionaries who said, I read that book, and that's one of the reasons I'm a missionary. These are very explicit connections. William Carey to India, Henry Martin to India and then to Persia, Robert Morrison, the great Chinese missionary who translated the Bible into Chinese, Samuel J. Mills, who had the idea for American missions and went to Mississippi and then he died sailing to Africa and was buried there, Adoniram Judson, the great missionary to Burma, Robert Murray McShane, who was a pastor in Scotland who took missionary trips to Israel, and David Livingston, who spent his life in Africa, Andrew Murray, a pastor in South Africa, who did the work of evangelism, Jim Elliott in our time, uh, who's famous for his ministry among the Hurani Indians in Ecuador. All of them said, wow, if only I loved Jesus like David Brainerd did. Well, David Brainerd was a product of the Great Awakening. So missions, bottom line, is always spurred by revival. That is, if somebody really loves God more, then they will want those around them to love God more. That is, that's, that's how it is when we love things, right? Um, you know, we were talking at lunch, and your pastor loves football, uh, soccer, we call it here. And, uh, and so he said, I'm going to watch the Euro Champion Final. And I said, oh, is that today? i got to watch that. And we share something, and as C.S. Lewis said 70 years ago, when you enjoy something, you enjoy it more when somebody else is enjoying it with you. That is, it compounds the enjoyment. That's, and that's what corporate worship is, right? And that's what drives evangelism. We want to gather worshipers. So the great missions movement of the 19th century flowed directly out of the first and second great awakenings and was really launched in the 1740s, and then that torch was picked up in the 1790s and early 1800s. So part of the impact is how God transformed people, both unbelievers, and how he transformed believers into missionaries. Second part of the impact is ecclesiastical. Are y'all with me still? If you list the major preachers of the First Great Awakening, starting with Jonathan Edwards, and then George Whitfield, Theodore Jacob Frelinghuysen, Gilbert Tennant, uh, Samuel Davenport even, none of them, not one, is a Baptist. The Baptists weren't really sure they should support this thing. The congregational churches were revived. If they rejected the revival, most of them turned Unitarian within two generations. The Presbyterian churches experienced tremendous revival that they carried into the next century with them. Virtually every denomination was affected, but no denomination in America experienced more explosive growth than the Baptists. And we're Baptists, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit of that story. Baptists were already in America. They were called regular Baptists. In 1730, there were a few Baptist churches in Rhode Island where the first two Baptist churches had been established a century earlier. There were a couple of churches in Massachusetts, one in Boston, one in western Massachusetts. There was a Baptist church in Connecticut. There were a few churches in eastern Pennsylvania, five or six. There were a couple of churches in or near Charleston, South Carolina. That's it. That's it. Baptists were, not, were neither numerous nor influential. Nobody cared what Baptists thought. Baptists had the temerity, the gall, to say that there's only one true baptism. And you Presbyterians, and you Anglicans, and you Methodists, and you, none of you have it. <laughs> that is, how, how dare you? And they all kind of got along. They had their differences. But those Baptists, those people are just nuts. The regular Baptists, when the awakening first began, held aloof. Several reasons. The leaders of the awakening were pedo-baptists. That is, they baptized infants. Would you support a revival when all the, all the revival preachers are saying, baptize your babies? They said, we're, we're not going to support that. The revivals experienced high emotion. 
Brother Martin mentioned that in the morning service. There were explosions of emotion in a number of these meetings. And the regular Baptists, who were pretty tight collars in, in the 1730s and 40s, said, you know, we're, we're not sure about all that enthusiasm. And then the strong emotional appeals that people like Whitfield and Tennant made, when the Baptists heard them, they said, are they really Calvinists? I mean, most of the Calvinists I know don't make wild, crazy appeals like that. You know, I, I'm not sure they, they're really orthodox. And these regular Baptists were pretty serious about their Calvinism. Well, they were not opposed to revival in general. And George Whitfield, who, by the way, did not like Baptist theology. Whitfield is famous. I'll probably say this again to you tonight, but he's famous as many of his converts began embracing Baptist views. He says, my chickens are becoming ducks. You know, he, didn't, he didn't like the fact that they were taking this immersion thing. But he, he thought the Baptists would, be a, would bring people to the meetings, and they, they agreed theologically on most. They agreed on the gospel, for sure. And so he reached out to them, and most of them were pro-revival by 1750. Their church life was regulated by confessions of faith, and that's why they were called regular Baptists. They were very serious about their Philadelphia Confession, which was adopted during the Great Awakening. Most regular Baptist churches adopted it. It had Calvinistic theology adapted from the London Confession. And when you hear that Calvinistic, there are Calvinists who say, why bother praying and evangelizing? They're going to go to heaven anyway. The majority of Calvinists have believed in evangelism. These people did. Now, there was a high Calvinism over in Britain at this very time, which was destructive, hyper-Calvinism, but not these guys. They believed in an educated clergy. Your pastors need to learn the creeds. They need to learn Greek and Hebrew. They got to learn theology. They believed in very formal worship, and they were slow to embrace the emotional revivals. After the awakening, they grew steadily. But if the regular Baptists were the story of Baptist history, I'm not sure we'd be here today. Because God raised up some other Baptists who became known as separate Baptists. And as Baptist history goes, they started from a church split. Here's the story. First Baptist Church of Boston. Whitfield announces, I'm coming to Boston. It was a city of 16,000, 17,000 people. Over 30,000 people gathered in Boston to hear him preach. And the pastor of First Baptist Church of Boston said, don't go hear that Whitfield guy. He's an enthusiast. And I'm not sure about his theology. Just, just avoid it. Well, of course, a bunch of members went anyway. I mean, you, you've experienced that, Pastor. I mean, they said, you know, Pastor said not to go, but we're going. I mean, everybody's going. And they went, and they came back to the church and said, man, this guy's great. I mean, he preaches the gospel, and he loves the Lord, and how can you not support this? And the pastor said, how dare you go without my approval? And they said, we're Baptists, you know. And they said, if, you, if you're opposed to Whitfield, then you're opposed to the gospel. And a big chunk of his church left, went down the road, and started Second Baptist Church of Boston. So it was a church split. And they said, when the gospel is being opposed, separation is necessary. You can't oppose an obvious work of God. That is, separation is sometimes over dumb stuff. But separating over the gospel is always the right thing to do. And that's what they did. And so they became known as separate Baptists which has come down to history as separate Baptists. Well, there's another source of these separate Baptists, and that is Presbyterian and congregational churches that experience revival. Think with me through this dynamic, and it'll be very clear to you. Whitfield comes to your church. You were sprinkled as a baby. You've been in the church all your life, and you think you're okay. You think you're okay. You're a pretty moral person. You give to the church, etc. And your pastor's never told you different. And then Whitfield shows up and says, your baptism will not save you. Your church membership will not save you. Your good works will not save you. You must be born again. And the Holy Spirit does his supernatural work in your heart. And you say, I need to get saved. Now, if, if that happens to two people in a church, one of them is going to say, you know what? I hope our church will think better about this issue. The other one is going to say, I think my infant baptism was the problem. I think that I was thinking I was okay all these years because I was sprinkled as a baby and told I was in the church. Maybe infant baptism needs to be reinvestigated. And a whole lot of congregationalists and Presbyterians started investigating infant baptism. Now the preacher was an infant baptizer. Whitfield, Edward, they were all infant baby baptizers. But their message of you must be born again caused a lot of people to reassess infant baptism. Numerous churches 
both among the congregations Presbyterians, experienced church splits. Sometimes members just left and started a Baptist church. That's the nice thing about Baptists. You don't have to have authority from anybody. If you've got a Bible, you can start a church. And they just left and started churches. Sometimes the pastor would become convinced that if a baptism was wrong. And he'd tell the church, I don't think, I don't think if a baptism is biblical. And they'd fire him. And he'd leave and take a, and a bunch of people would follow him and start a new church. Sometimes the pastor would announce it and the people would say, yeah, you're right. And the whole church would just vote to become Baptist. Numerous churches changed into Baptist churches. Over 50 congregational churches in New England, we know, simply voted to become Baptist churches. Is that amazing? That is, this revival was not some Baptist preacher saying you ought to become Baptist. It was somebody saying you ought to be born again, and then the people start reading their Bibles and they become Baptists. These separate Baptists had almost no affiliation with the regulars. They were completely different from the regulars. In New England and the Middle Colonies, Baptists exploded. They had almost no continuity with the regular Baptists. There were so many of these churches, there's no way they could wait around for their pastors to get formal training somewhere. So it didn't require it. I mean, if, if the guy can read his Bible and stand in front of an audience and talk and seems reasonably mature, he could be pastor. And, uh, you know, let, let the regulars and the Presbyterians and all those people get seminary degrees. We just need somebody who's full of spirit. Emotional, spontaneous worship. That is, uh, one of these preachers, Shubal Stearns, was known for his holy wine because he, he could really uh, shuck the corn, we used to say. I mean, he'd really get into it when he was preaching vibrantly pro-revival. What's interesting about these separate Baptist churches is that when they gathered as churches and adopted confessions of faith, they almost always adopted the Philadelphia Confession because theologically they were pretty much equivalent to the regulars. They didn't disagree about what they believed. They disagreed about how they functioned. They were definitely less theological in orientation. What's important, to, so let me mention one of these key guys, and that's Isaac Bacchus. Isaac Bacchus was converted in 1741 through the preaching of George Whitfield. He is a Great Awakening convert. At first, he was a pro-revival, a new light congregationalist. Ten years later, he became a pastor of a congregationalist church that was pro-revival in Norwich, Connecticut. He was pastor there for five years. But that whole time, he was wrestling with the baptism question. And in 1756, through his own study of the scriptures, he announced to his church, uh, I've become a Baptist. It would be like Pastor Walker coming in one Sunday and saying, you know, I'm sorry, you know, I've, I've become Episcopalian. He announced that he was Baptist. And the church said, well, then we'll be looking for a new pastor. And he said, I get it. And he resigned. He went across the border into Massachusetts to Middleborough and became the pastor of a Baptist church. And by the way, a good bunch of those people in, in Norwich followed him up there. And they established a new Baptist church, which he pastored for the next 50 years. During those 50 years, Isaac Bacchus has become the leader in New England in the Baptist campaign for religious liberty. That is, the battle for religious liberty was primarily led by Baptists who had been impacted by the Great Awakening. The main impact of separate Baptists, though, was in the South. Because by this time, there are two or three Baptist churches in Charleston, South Carolina. And I don't have time, time for a lot of asides, but that happened because a Baptist pastor in Maine decided he would move, and he sailed to Charleston, and his whole church picked up and sailed down there with him. They didn't have another Baptist church in Maine for like 100 years, and they started First Baptist Church of Charleston, which is still preaching the gospel today. Founded 1693, I believe, and it's still preaching the gospel today. It's a Southern Baptist church today, but it's very conservative. And William Screven planted a couple more churches in that area, and that was it. There were no Baptist churches in North Carolina. There were no Baptist churches in South Carolina. There were no Baptist churches in Georgia or Tennessee. There were one or two in the mountains of Virginia, probably modern West Virginia. But as far as mainland Virginia, below the mountains, there were no Baptist churches. Is, is, is that amazing? I mean, we live up in Wisconsin where everywhere you look at Lutherans and Catholics. And I tell my Lutheran, you know, I tell my fellow professors, if you go to North Carolina and you've got a strong arm, you can throw a rock and it hits three Baptist churches before it hits the ground. Well, when did that happen? It happened as a result of the Great Awakening. I mentioned Shubal Stearns. He was converted in 1745 through the preaching of George Whitfield, who had just returned from England. By six years later, he had become a separate Baptist. 
he had embraced believer's baptism. His brother-in-law, Daniel Marshall, did the same thing. And the two of them said, you know, there are plenty of churches up here in New England. We need to go where there are no Baptist churches, the South. All right, think about how things have switched. And so he heads south with his brother-in-law, 1754. Well, Virginia was very repressive. Uh, the House of Burgesses was dominated by the Anglican Church. It was really hard to land in Virginia. They went through Virginia and settled in Sandy Creek, North Carolina. Now, that's not Sandy Creek down near Wilmington, but Sandy Creek near Gil in Guilford County, central part of the state. 1755, became the pastor of Sandy Creek Baptist Church. He's going to pastor for the rest of his life. When they arrived... There were 16 members, virtually all family members. Over the next three years, it grew to 606 members. You say, well, how'd that happen? I think it's the Whitfield effect. You know, Whitfield's been crisscrossing North Carolina. And, and nobody thought these tobacco planters, the middle of North Carolina, were, were interested in religion. They were interested in selling tobacco and making money and having big plantations and don't bother me with religion. And so nobody was evangelizing them. And then this church got dropped down in the middle and these members just started going out and evangelizing everybody, including, by the way, the African-American slaves who they were welcomed into membership in this church. And it exploded. It just absolutely exploded. Let me quote Morgan Edwards, who visited Sandy Creek a year after Schubelstern's death. In 17 years, Sandy Creek has spread its branches westward as far as the Great River Mississippi. Southward as far as Georgia, Daniel Marshall went to Georgia and planted churches there. Eastward to the sea in Chesapeake Bay, original spelling, and northward to the waters of the Potomac. It, in 17 years, has become mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother to 42 churches from which sprang 125 ministers. Right. That's separate Baptists who are saying, listen, we've got the truth and we're going to give it out everywhere. Incredible expansion. Baptists blanketed the South. They baptized it, if you will. They started associations in South Carolina and North Carolina, eventually in Virginia. They expanded westward, Tennessee and Kentucky, and then eventually the Mississippi and Ohio Valleys. The strongest denomination on the frontier, with the possible exception of the Methodists and their circuit-riding preachers, was the Baptists. David Beale gives a statement in his church history, his Baptist history book, which I use as a textbook, which is almost impossible to believe, but he's one of the most reliable scholars I've ever known. David Beale says that in 1700, there were about 24 Baptist churches in America. In 1800, there were nearly 65,000 Baptist churches in America. Not 65,000 Baptists, 65,000 Baptist churches in America. We were the second largest denomination in America by then. By 1850, we'll be the largest denomination in America. Today, we're second to the Roman Catholics. Now, there's a whole lot of nominal Baptists out there, but if we're just counting heads. No event spurred this growth more than the Great Awakening. This church is probably here in the middle of North Carolina because 200 years ago, separate Baptists up in New England said, man, those people need the gospel down there. And God just did a work, just set the, just set the fields on fire with the gospel. And then lastly, there is national impact as a result of this revival. Uh, in two parts, first of all, there's restoration. The Puritan foundation of America was seriously eroding by the middle of the 18th century. By the early 18th century, materialism, rationalism, deism were leading to spiritual blight in America. It was worse over in England, and God sent the evangelical awakening through the Wesleys and Whitfield there. But in America, they were feeling the effects. That is, in Puritan New England, for instance, religion dominated the first 40 years of the colonies. By the end of the century, Puritans are looking around saying, we don't even know Boston anymore. All they're about is making money. But this revival restored spiritual fervor. It somewhat reversed, I say somewhat, it's never a straight line, but it somewhat reversed the slide away from morality, respect for God's word, and reverence for God. And therefore, it was preparation for what was on the horizon. That restoration was necessary because war is about to break out. A brutal war. French and Indian War first in the 50s and 60s and the uh, War for Independence in the 70s and 80s. 
The revival had more unifying effects on the colonies than any political or economic reality. I don't have time to fully defend that statement, and you won't read it in secular textbooks. But people all over America had embraced the same God. They had embraced a vision for the truth of the scriptures. Key leaders, intellectual elites, had imbibed various forms of deism. So you can read about uh, Thomas Paine, Ethan Allen, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, who became a Unitarian late in life, uh, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison. These are important figures in our history, and they were by no means Orthodox Christians. But rank-and-file Americans had a Christian worldview. That is, I think we have to, and I'm getting, I know, into waters, I mean, Pastor Walker can put out the fires later. But there are some who want to teach a Christian American view in which they find Thomas Jefferson quoting the Bible and say he was a godly man. And then there are some who want to teach a completely secular version of early American history. The truth is very much in the middle between those two extremes. The truth of the matter is, you had all different levels of spiritual sensitivity at the time. And church attendance in the early days of our country was lower percentage-wise than it is today. So to talk about a Christian America in colonial times is, is risky. But the Great Awakening had revived the Puritan emphasis of 100 years earlier and had spread it through the colonies so that most people thought like Christians, even if they weren't. You say, why is that important? Well, because there's another revolt going on on the other side of the ocean just a few years later. It's the French Revolution. If there had been no Great Awakening, if the slide away from morality and God had continued at the same pace it had been doing since about 1670, it's possible that we could have had a French Revolution. And the French Revolution was anti-clerical, that is anti-pastoral, anti-religion, anti-God. And the result was a bloodbath. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a horrible story. And allowed for a dictator like a Napoleon to rise up. We could have had that. And you know, there are aspects of that in our revolution. I mean, we can't whitewash the whole thing. I mean, there was brutality in our, you know, people weren't always treated well. But overall, the American Revolution was dominated by law and sound principles. It was an orderly revolution. It was pro-church. Separation of church and state protected the rights of all viewpoints to be heard. God prepared America through the Great Awakening. I'm not sure we would have the America we have today had it not been for the Great Awakening. So what is the impact? Well, it's enormous. Individually, thousands were saved through revival and the resulting missions. Ecclesiastically, a right view of the church, Baptist theology, emerged and spread across this young country. Nationally, America was prepared for a remarkably devout revolution, if I can put it that way. And this is the context for the Second Great Awakening, which transformed American culture. When you think of American culture and our having high standards of decency towards prisoners and rights of people, etc., all of that flows out of the Second Great Awakening. But there would have been no Second Great Awakening apart from the first. So America's glorious founding on Judeo-Christian principles would not likely have occurred apart from the Great Awakening. And are we the heirs of that? We truly are. So God can make changes, big and small. But when it's all said and done, you look back and say, what hath God wrought? Wow. And nobody's going to stand in the way if, if he's at work. That is, he bears his omnipotent arm and no divination no soothsaying, no anything will be able to reverse the flood that God turns loose. So that's our hope. Uh, and it's our hope at the micro and macro levels. We can pray for our world, for our country, for our state, for our city, for our church, for our household. It's the same work in every case. Any questions? Yes, sir, Joe. There's a pretty good history of it by Edwin Gaustad, G-A-U-S-T-A-D, The Great Awakening in New England. He gives a lot of good information about, he's a Baptist scholar, and I think he's fair with the data, and he's a pretty good writer. Yeah, I think that's probably the first place I'd send you, because it's pretty accessible. It's, it's not brutally long. It's just a couple hundred pages. Unitarianism and New Light Congregation. 
Yeah, let me, let me do the second one first. The Presbyterians and Congregationalists, when the revival came to them, they didn't universally agree with it either. And the ones who said, this is opposed to the way we've always done things, became known as the old lights. And those who said, we think this is a great idea, became known as the new lights. And so oftentimes churches would split over whether you're pro or anti-revival uh, in, in the sense that revival was taking place. And sometimes whole churches would embrace a new light or an old light philosophy. So that's, a, that's an issue within those denominations. The separate, the, so to use that nomenclature, the regulars were for a while old light, and then most of them came over to a new light position. The separates were enthusiastically new light from day one. But with the Baptists, we don't, that language isn't applied as much. Uh, and then Unitarianism is the belief that uh, Jesus was not God, that the Trinity is a later philosophical addition, that there is simply one God, and that uh, praying to Jesus or believing in a supernatural Jesus is wrong. It's a, a very rationalistic position. And Unitarianism swept into these congregational churches that rejected the revival in large number. That is, many of these churches uh, in Massachusetts along the eastern seaboard became Unitarian by about 1800. And uh, it led to New England being the mission field it is today. Unitarian, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship today is a denomination that's basically all about just being a good person. They don't even read their Bibles much anymore. Yeah, I apologize for not defining that. Any other questions? Are you thankful for the Great Awakening? In many ways, it directly impacted you and me.